Okay, everybody. Well, I just I'm going to start this presentation. Um, really appreciate your time. I know how busy we all are. Today's webinar is marketing telehealth in the time of COVID-19, caring for your patients while positioning your practice for post-crisis growth. We have about a 40-minute presentation followed uh, by some time if we want to do a question and answer session. Uh, that can be accessed through the chat section of, uh, of the webinar. Um, and then we'll, we'll go through those questions at the end. We'll be out of here in less than an hour. I'm Mike Colleen. I direct client marketing at Lens, uh, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. Uh, I also uh, teach healthcare marketing to graduate students at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. I'm wrapping up my fourth year doing that. And as soon as this is over, I'll be grading a lot of papers. Really excited to get back to that. Uh, I'm joined by Tom Bell, who you'll hear from in just a moment. He's a brand strategist at Lens, uh, our go-to guy for a lot of healthcare consultation for our clients, and also co-founder of Chronicle, which is a marketing consulting firm and content uh, company. Okay, just a few words about us. Uh, we've specialized in healthcare marketing for nearly 30 years. Uh, we've worked with over 100 hospitals, physician practices, and healthcare companies um, of all stripes. And our model is to be a fully integrated, full service agency where you can turn to us for just about anything you need in the marketing communication space, whether it's strategic planning, uh, brand development, uh, digital marketing, of course, creative and advertising services, as well as public relations. And you can learn more about us online, of course, a variety of places, including our website, which is lensmarketing.com. Something else about us, uh, some of you may know, is we own uh, media as well. Uh, we produce several radio uh, programs, including the Weekly Checkup, which is a healthcare radio program airing in Atlanta on News Talk WSB, in Tampa on 102.5 The Bone. And then we also own and produce uh, a show on WSB called Lens on Business, which is the, the business show on 95.5. And that's a, also a weekly show where we bring in uh, experts, uh, leaders in their field to talk about uh, tips for business success, and also inspirational stories. So uh, another way that we help market our, our clients. Okay, but what we're here today to talk about, of course, is telehealth. Um, you know, the, the, the point of this, the reason I'm sure those of you that are here are here, is because you want to know what does all this mean for my practice, for my patients, for my business. Um, and so that's really the point of the presentation. Um, to get there though, we're gonna talk just a little bit about the history of telehealth, about the trend lines we were seeing before COVID-19, um, what we're seeing currently, how Lens is supporting our clients and what we, what we aspire to, to be best practices for rolling out marketing communications in a time like this. And then also a look ahead about how you as administrators, practice leaders, uh, physicians can uh, take steps to embrace the new reality of this telehealth and roll it into your business and marketing plans. And as I mentioned, we have uh, a lot of great registrants and participants on, on this uh, webinar today. Really appreciate the time and energy it takes to, to set aside time for this. Uh, and it's of all stripes. Again, we have hospital and practice leaders. We have physicians, marketing and media as well as con consultants, business development directors, and physician liaisons. Um, not enough time to touch on everything in the telehealth world. Um, there are probably many people on this call who know more than we do in terms of some aspects of telehealth because you've been managing businesses and considering reimbursement and regulation and that sort of thing. What we're trying to bring to you today is a perspective from a marketing and branding and uh, strategic communication side. And so we hope that there's something valuable for everyone today. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pass uh, the mic to Tom and uh, he's gonna take the next section for us. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we get into deeply, we just wanna make sure we're all on the same page. And so let's just briefly define what we mean by telehealth. Um, we're thinking of this as healthcare provided through interactive electronic media, either between patient and provider or among healthcare providers. And it includes virtual visits and consults, which is gonna be the main focus of our present presentation today. But uh, it also includes remote patient monitoring, patient portals, and secure messaging. So 
let's start off by looking back at telehealth trends as they were before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Now, the data show over and over that patients want convenience more than anything. And telehealth was giving that to them. They, they, they liked it. They wanted ways to access healthcare in ways that were easy, that were not time consuming, that gave them good access to care. You guys know all this, but the point being, even before the crisis hit, patients already wanted telehealth and many of them were finding ways to access it when they could. And uh, this is from a, a poll done by Amwell um, in 2019. 66% of patients said they were willing to use telehealth. 25% um, said that they would even switch primary care providers to be able to access it, and even more so among millennials. And even the idea that, that seniors might be less willing to access technology to do it seems not to have been such a major concern after all. Physicians too, um, they had some concerns about telehealth that we'll discuss in a few minutes, but a solid majority of physicians polled by Amwell in 2019 um, were open to trying telehealth. Many had used it and many more intended to do so soon. And when they did try it, a strong majority approved of the results. They agreed that it improved access to care, it enabled high quality communications, even enhanced the doctor patient relationship. Now, in this pre-COVID world of telehealth adoption, we also saw the rise of third-party direct-to-consumer telehealth providers, such as Amwell, Doctor on Demand, Teladoc, and MD Live. Now, in some ways, these companies are kind of the virtual equivalent of the urgent care facility, the sort to which you may already sometimes refer your patients. They've been popular with private insurance companies, generally well-received by patients who try them. But they do also raise some concerns. They are, of course, limited in what care they can provide, and some medical professionals are concerned about the quality of that care. From a business perspective, they may in some cases divert revenue from traditional providers, and they encourage patients to view telehealth services as kind of a commodity that's delivered by whoever happens to show up on their screen rather than by the trusted medical professionals in their local practice. So with direct-to-consumer telehealth, your practice loses ownership of that patient relationship, and this may weaken their loyalty to you. So, okay, patients were interested, phys physicians were open, direct-to-consumer startups were growing, and telehealth adoption was already on the rise, with many thought leaders and analysts predicting big growth to come in 2020. Uh, a study by the DMA found that um, physicians offering virtual visits had doubled from 2016 to 2019, and 87% of physicians said that they saw advantages to using those digital tools. So it was, it was already rising before the crisis came along. But while telehealth adoption was on the rise, there were some barriers to its wider acceptance and use. Now, we mentioned earlier that a majority of patients polled were willing to try telehealth visits. However, few had actually done so, and many were unaware that their physicians even offered them. This is again from the Anwell survey. Now, in our, when we look at these sorts of stats where we see 66% of patients willing to use telehealth, but only 8% having used it, 23% offering it, 6% saying that their doctors offer it. We look at a gap like that and we see a clear case for better marketing. Another barrier to adoption was that many physicians, practices, and hospitals still had some concerns about telehealth. Uh, in 2019, physicians cited the following concerns. They were concerned about reimbursement, questions of clinical appropriateness, and obviously, fortunately for all of us, doctors really take seriously that oath to take care of patients. And generations of doctors have been taught that means laying hands on their patients, feeling their pulse, listening to their lungs and heart, examining them closely in person and telehealth clearly can't replicate all of that. And there's also the reality that telehealth is better suited to some specialties than others and more appropriate for some patient concerns than others. And then there's the question of physician buy-in, which is related to the, the prior two points. And then finally, many physicians didn't think telehealth was a priority for top executives in their organizations. Will leadership provide the necessary organizational support? Will they approve the necessary investments? 
Regulatory restrictions have also slowed the adoption of telehealth, and in some cases, this may indeed be appropriate as a means of ensuring quality of care. And the enabling technology for telehealth has also been a barrier. The regulatory barriers were also partly a technological barrier. You couldn't use your iPhone. You had to pay for new hardware, subscribe to expensive software, just so that you could perhaps not bill patients as well as you did before. And while the direct-to-consumer model has had some early success, as we said earlier, it, a lot of it has been based on that low-hanging fruit, a patient with a cold, a sore throat, maybe a cut that's on the borderline between needing a Band-Aid or stitches. Behavioral health has been an interesting development the last couple of years, and it does seem to be an example of one field that seems to adapt pretty well to virtual visits. But in other specialties, there's the inherent limitation of being a telehealth-only provider. Unless we get to some sci-fi future with advanced medical robots, many, even most healthcare services will not be possible through telehealth. Webcams can't wield scalpels or lasers or give a blood transfusion. And, and the direct-to-consumer model is so far a commodity business. While there is some ability to say, request the same therapist you spoke with last week, in general, these outfits encourage patients to view providers as interchangeable, talk with whoever shows up on the screen, tell them your most personal health concerns, even though you've never met them before and may never see them again. So that's where telehealth adoption was and was going prior to the, uh, prior to the pandemic. It was generally popular with patients, gaining some acceptance with physicians, seeing growth in adoption, but held back by many factors. And then the pandemic came and in the last couple of months, everything has changed. As you obviously know, many hospitals have been overwhelmed with COVID-19 cases and all hospitals are attempting to limit the spread of the virus by keeping contagious people isolated or quarantined. Telehealth is helping with both of these. Hospitals and practices are using telehealth to triage, to offer remote care, to protect the uninfected, to even allow quarantined healthcare workers to continue seeing patients and to continue seeing patients for those other urgent or ongoing health concerns aside from the virus. But this is also an economic crisis for many hospitals and practices. You have patients who are anxious and postponing their appointments or canceling their appointments. Elective procedures had been banned for a while. New patient appointments have been delayed and many patients are out of work or struggling financially. And while telehealth can't replace all the lost revenue this causes, it does offer practices a lifeline during the crisis. More importantly, it's a way to maintain current patient loyalty and even begin relationships with new patients. Patients who may be looking for a provider who has telehealth as an option if they don't feel comfortable coming into your office quite yet. Regulations and restrictions um, have also been relaxed for the duration of the COVID-19 public health emergency. We're not gonna go deeply into the details of this today, but just very briefly, CMS has loosened restrictions on telehealth reimbursement during the crisis. Larger private insurers were already ahead of Medicare in promoting and reimbursing for telehealth with fewer restrictions. During the crisis, many are waiving co-pays and deductibles while promoting telehealth alternatives. This, by the way, includes promoting those third-party direct-to-consumer telehealth companies. HHS has said that HIPAA will not be enforced for practices using non-public facing consumer platforms such as FaceTime, Skype, or Google Hangouts, although we believe this is very likely temporary. So FaceTime is not a long-term solution for telehealth, just to stop gap. Uh, public facing platforms, by the way, such as Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok are still not allowed, so please don't get on TikTok with your patients. So in the midst of these simultaneous public health and economic crises, and with some of the prior barriers lowered, many healthcare providers are doing in days or weeks what they had planned to do over the next few years. This graph is from an article in the New England Journal of Medicine describing how four practices transitioned rapidly to telehealth during the COVID crisis. And I'll just spell it out for the, the blue lines show in-office visits, the, the green bar is telehealth visits. And you can see how overnight, almost all of their in-office visits fell away and a large percentage of them, of them shifted over overnight to telehealth visits. Now, clearly this is not fully made up for 
everything that they lost when they were still able to do all these in-office visits. But it has kind of kept the fires running for them. And everywhere we look, we're seeing this surge in telehealth adoption. You're seeing it too. Um, this, uh, this is from Merritt Hawkins, a survey of physicians. They surveyed physicians in 2018 and then again this month. And those who had used telehealth went from 18% to 48%. And then this is an example that was provided by the advisory board of a anonymized medical center in New York City that had 14 virtual visits total in 2019, and then the same number in three days and one day in March. And at the same time, we're seeing these telehealth uh, platforms um, boom. So after the crisis hit, many of our clients chose and implemented a new telehealth platform in the space of a week or two. Now, either a, it could either be a standalone platform like some of these or an integrated EHR platform that includes virtual visits. Now, there are a lot of factors to consider in choosing one of these platforms if you're in the midst of doing that now, including cost and security, technology, support, integration, we're not gonna go into all that today, but we do recommend that you consider how well the platform lets you customize your telehealth experience to be brand consistent. We've done a fair bit of research into the various platforms out there. We're not going to cover that today, but if any of you are in the process of selecting one, please do reach out to us offline and we'll be happy to share that with you. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Mike. Thanks, Tom. Well, you know, I Anytime there are clinical and operational adjustments like there were um, with the crisis uh, with all these healthcare organizations, there should of course be a marketing communications response as well. Um, so this is what we saw, just to look inside, you know, our agency at Lens and what we were seeing with our clients. You know, we, we work with dozens and dozens of healthcare organizations of different sizes, various geographies, what have you. And this is, this is what was happening when this, when this really broke. Um, suddenly, we moved from what we would call marketing, which, which is, you know, narrowly defined as new patient acquisition, you know, trying to, to, uh, to bring new people into the business, to really a communication strategy, you know, where it was more focused on current patients. It was, uh, it was really a triage effect, you know, or approach, I should say. How are we going to make sure that the people that have appointments keep them? How are we going to make sure that those, um, you know, who need our care on a uh, recurring basis who we already know come back and see us? So really a focus through owned channels. Um, you know, we, di we distinguish owned, which is your website, your social media, your e-newsletter, you know, versus not quite as much paid media. Um, because it was about reaching these existing patients and it was about awareness and education. Uh, for many, many practices, they, they maybe would have three or four doctors at a large practice that were practicing telemedicine and they had to get the message out to all their patients that this is available, this is what it is, and this is how it works. Um, it was less strategic at first, frankly, it was about awareness and education. Um, so, you know, want to want to thank George Urology and, and uh, another client that I'll I'll uh, share with you in just a moment uh, for letting us share some of our, our work. You know, when we when this started, it was a little bit of a litmus test, frankly, as we were working with, you know, probably more than 30 different uh, organizations to get the message out about telehealth. We found there was a litmus test developing um, those that had a crisis communications plan those that had centralized decision-making, those that had a marketing structure for uh, coordination, all did very well and we were able to support them. The leadership at George Urology really excelled in these ways and, and because of that, we were able to collaborate with them and get messages out really quickly. We also have some clients um, who you know, are a little less um, coordinated in their marketing and frankly, we're we're looking to try to remember where passwords were and who, who can make that decision and that sort of thing. So uh, we're gonna talk more about this later, but this, uh, this crisis has been a reminder that it's important to have a plan um, because you're gonna have urgent communication needs in the future as well. But what we see here is something, all the work you're gonna see happen in about 36 hours. Um, 
we uh, updated the website, we created a, a primary navigation for telemedicine, we posted a, a, a notice at the top of the page, you know, with safety protocols. Uh, blogs and FAQs, um, you know, kind of the, the classic, what are you going to do if the ball is hit to you mentality from Little League Baseball, frankly, where, you know, if, if there's a crisis, you know, what are the seven or eight buttons you hit? And so they were content here, um, tips, more functional use of, hey, how does telemedicine even work for those that, that are interested in having an appointment? All the way through to quickly updating uh, an ad that was due the next day for Atlanta Magazine. Flyers, both for their adult and pediatric populations that outlined, um, you know, not only that telehealth was available, but we'll talk in a minute about a nuanced message that, hey, there also was a physician in the offices um, as needed for, for serious health needs. Social media, of course, is one of the most uh, nimble uh, messaging platforms we have, and, and we were very active trying to make sure that we were constantly getting the message out um, that, that, you know, things were changing, telehealth is available to, to their patients. Okay, and then, thank you, and then even another client of ours um, that we work closely with and have for years is South Coast Health, uh, 80 plus physicians located in, in Savannah, multi-specialty, similarly, uh, a great working relationship with them, great leadership there that, that knew which buttons to push to disseminate messages quickly, so website alerts, um, buttons for virtual visits, and focused e-newsletter that went out, um, again, here because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk later about integrating virtual health messaging into your overall communications and even operational strategy but here step one is just awareness and education so this is an example these are examples of very very focused communications a print ad all about this message just trying to drive awareness that you know the the other kind of uh, organizations that tom was talking about teledoc and and what have you are not the only place you can go, uh, that you can maintain your relationship with your provider, um, that they'll have access to your records, all these advantages and familiarity to, you know, to, to build loyalty, which we'll, we'll talk about again later. Um, in this particular market, a slightly smaller market, a, a, a big part of the community, a major employer, we found that the, the news media was interested in, in learning about their operational adjustments, and so there was a PR component to this as well. And then, of course, social media is, is key anytime you're trying to reach your audience uh, quickly. And here are, are a video example on the left, um, and then, you know, pushing to, to blog content on the right. So, okay, so that's, that's the triage mentality I was, you know, Tom and I were speaking about. It was a health crisis. It was a, a potential financial crisis for our clients. So the question was what to do about it. Well, get the word out about telehealth and you can do that. Well, this situation is evolving and, and those that are on this, this webinar are probably at various stages of implementation, right? Probably some of you have done telehealth for years. Some maybe just started uh, last month. Um, some perhaps are even bringing this online uh, as we speak. So, but certainly we need to start thinking about next steps so we can get ahead of this. The challenge with that is that there's so much we don't know. Um, you know, this is an evolving situation. The news on it changes regularly. There was some potentially good news uh, yesterday um, about clinical trials, um, but it's, it's moving rapidly and there are a lot of unanswered questions and that makes it hard to plan. So some of the questions, uh, well, th this is, we, we spoke to a number of uh, healthcare leaders and, and this is a quote that I thought said it well. Um, until we have a vaccine, we don't know how long we'll have to behave differently, so we don't know what regulation and reimbursement will look like. It's hard to plan around a world that you, know, you don't understand, but there are some things we do know. First, the unknowns. What's gonna happen with the things Tom discussed? HIPAA, uh, can you cross state lines for telehealth? How much of this will return to the old days? How much of this will stay where it is now? Regulations have been loosened. Uh, co-pays and deductibles have in some cases been eliminated. 
Um, we have parity for comparable in-person visits. Will that be the new norm? These are things we don't know. But it, to some degree, oh, I'm sorry, yes. So, and then we also have, no matter what, the, the, the deep-seated realities that predated COVID are of course not just gonna disappear. Our clinicians will still see advantages um, of course, to seeing patients in the offices. Um, we will likely still have reimbursement that um, even if there is parity, like Tom says, you can't perform surgery through telehealth and some of the more um, lucrative and profitable parts of, of running uh, a, a healthcare organization that sustains everything else require the patient being in the office so that you can in, at times steer them to ancillary services that are required, such as lab tests and what have you. So, so that's not gonna change, but the reality is we are gonna be living in, an, in a new environment and we're gonna to have to figure out what that means and how to plan against that. There's data on, on, on this uh, as much as you need, but also we don't need it, do we? We can just be pretty confident that more patients are gonna know uh, uh, what tel telehealth is and how it works, um, that more physicians are gonna offer it, that they have learned how to provide it. Um, that there's an expectation that it's offered. Um, this is all going to be in place. And if you need any evidence of, of what is in the zeitgeist, just look at what Google searches tell you. And that's, that jump is in the uh, first quarter of 2020. Um, and so everybody's looking into it. And that muscle memory, we believe, that culture, we believe, um, that expectation, we believe, is, is, is not going to go anywhere. Another healthcare leader told us basically on the same schedule as the vaccine, you know, if, if, if you're going to be in this business, you got to have a tele, telemed, telehealth, virtual visit plan or you're going to lose patients. So that's what the experts said. And then, of course, we have experts on this, this call as well. Um, certainly not a statistically significant survey, but we thought worth sharing with what is the group on this, on this webinar uh, believe. Well, first of all, 13 out of the 16 of you are already offering telehealth to your patients, okay? So that's not surprising. Um, a similarly large number, um, what would that be, 80%, uh, plan to make this a fully integrated mode of care post-COVID-19. Uh, of course, you're all in different uh, contexts, but we would recommend that. And then just about 90% certainty um, from this group that it will, it'll have a lasting change in patient behavior and culture. So, and also as, uh, you know, as, as it's sometimes said, follow the money, right? And we're seeing large investment in health IT and medical technology um, around the telehealth business. And that's usually just as strong an indicator of anything uh, that, that we're going to see more activity in this area. So, it's, it's, it's a patient expectation, um, and it's, a, it, it's now a, a, a supply side business interest as well. So what do we do now? What do you do now with this in consideration, right? You, if we can agree, and I think we can, that, that the game has changed. Well, first of all, let's not forget that the early adopters have signed on to telehealth and telemedicine but I bet you have a lot of patients who have not yet. I bet your numbers are down. We saw the chart Tom shared earlier where a big slice of the pie is moving from in-office visits to help telehealth, but that overall visits of any kind, check-ins, what have you, are down. So we need to continue. This is, a, this is a decades and decades of muscle memory that we're trying to overturn quickly. It's gonna take more time than just four to six weeks. So we need to educate and aware, make, or make people aware. But we also need to start, instead of just throwing a, a, you know, a pop-up banner on our website that says we have telehealth, we need to start integrating our messaging into our overall communication structure of what we, who we are and what we do, and find a way to promote both in-office and telehealth visits simultaneously. So you know, these are some of the questions your, your patients are going to be asking. Um, wh why should they use virtual visits and check-ins if the offices are back open? 
right? Because many of you right now are having conversations. Many of our clients are having conversations. We're allowed to open now, perhaps, right? State regulations, guidance from the Surgeon General are, are saying surgeries, ambulatory surgery centers, uh, in-office visits, you know, uh, elective surgeries, th these things are all back online. You're trying to figure out the right way to do it, the right timing to do it, but also how to balance the advantages maybe you found in some of this telehealth um, with, with the long-term needs of, of, of seeing patients in your treatment centers. So these are the questions that your audience is going to be asking, looking for answers for, and you're going to need a plan to address these. So again, circling back to our friends at Georgia Urology, we have entered this, this next phase where we are saying, hey, we're opening our uh, offices and treatment centers back up. Telehealth is still available and we're starting to roll out messaging that helps outline which is a better fit for, and for whom so that there's, there can be an effort to segment audience and uh, patient populations based on what is good for their care. Here's an e-newsletter. Social media, of course. Even some PR um, and news coverage around their um, telehealth option. And then with South Coast, the same thing. So integrating an option for virtual visits on the website uh, in, in terms of the, the four patients section. Simple things, but things that matter. A landing page dedicated to virtual visits where all your questions can be answered, but where this now is seen as one of many offerings for your patients that again starts to discuss, hey, we can do more than virtual now, but which of you are right for virtual at what stage in your care and how does that interact with, with the, the traditional exam room experience of a patient? blogs on the topic, as well as uh, what follows, which is an e-newsletter. Print ads, where as you see lower right, virtual visits are now integrated into the offerings. It's no longer breaking news. We have virtual visits. It's starting to evolve to one of the ways we care about you and provide holistic care for you is by offering this treatment option. So it's an integrated message. Okay, so what comes next? So step one, you're more or less saying to your patients, telehealth exists, we offer it, this is how you access it. Step two is evolving your messaging. Once that message starts to get out there and say, hey, this is part of our, our overall holistic offerings to you. And, and, and when, now that you have a second, maybe restructuring your, your communications platforms um, to give it its proper role and place in your messaging. But what happens next? Well, let's think about strategic messaging opportunities. And, and again, a, a varied audience, um, you know, <laughs> Lenz's mantra is uh, the answer to your marketing question is it depends, you know, what business are you in? Who is your competition? What is the context? What is the environment? Um, you know, who's your audience, et cetera. So, so this, there's never one size fits all, but we all, all are living in this environment that, that we have now um, with COVID and it's creating some public health realities that perhaps create messaging opportunities for us. Um, the public needs our healthcare, they're not getting it and you need the public's uh, uh, trust in your ability to deliver their care for the good of your business. So if you've read the headlines over the next, over the last week or so, um, nearly a third of Americans have put off healthcare during COVID-19. There's different reasons for this. Um, you know, there's, there, certainly there's financial reasons having to do with job loss and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, but there's also uh, fear that people are going to get sick if they come to the doctor, if they leave their house, if they interact with other people. Um, and, and people a lot are, are suffering because of that. Um, we're seeing a rise in unexplained deaths. Um, we're seeing more cardiovascular challenges. Um, a lot of our clients are reporting that important uh, visits are not being kept, ones that could have long-term effects on their health. And so this, this really is a, it's, it's awful and it's a challenge, but it also presents an opportunity. This is what, uh, 
someone we talked to told us is is the the tragic irony in, in this of course is that you know the the at risk populations for covid you know who are uh, immunocompromised or perhaps the elderly the ones who most need the most substantive health care are skipping it and uh at the same time, these are the people who maybe are most at risk to visit you in a public setting such as your, your office. And so that's where telehealth can potentially play a role to maintain that relationship, assess the situation, and then um, you know, encourage or coordinate a more substantive in-person uh, patient visit. But on the messaging side, this is just be one idea of, of how we're gonna encourage our patients to address this. Again, every specialty is different. The effects of COVID varies across industry. Um, but right now we have a real public health messaging opportunity. And this is something for, for all of us, I think to be really excited about, you know, um, healthcare marketing gets mixed reviews sometimes in the, in, in the public's mind, you know. Um, there are marketing created uh, health crises. Um, there are, uh, cure all pills that that uh, the FDA frowns upon, and a lot of times when we think about healthcare marketing, we're thinking about real ethical dilemmas. Well, that's not what you guys are doing, um, but that's the public's perspective. What you guys are doing are just trying to connect uh, with the patients who need you, and you know healthcare marketing at its best. That's what it's doing. It's connecting doctors, nurses, PAs, physicians assistants with patients who need their care. And so this is a real opportunity to not only grow the business, um, but to grow this from a public health standpoint and, a, and an outcomes basis. And so, you know, it, it doesn't need to be uh, as much about, hey, our practice is better than the other practice. It needs to be, you, you, you need to take care of this health need that you have no matter who you go see. Um, that's good for the public's health. That's good for your image. That's good for outcomes. Um, we need a rising tide that, that lifts all boats that tells people it's safe to see your doctor. These precautions are being taken. COVID is a very serious issue, but so is getting screened for cancer. Um, so is coming in if you have a pain in your chest. Um, so is getting uh, your allergy treatment um, and, and many, other, many other things. And the way to do this, we think, is to be truly topical and timely um, with quick videos, blogs, public relations. This is a topic that everyone is thinking about. We have more consumption of news media than ever before um, because everybody's home and everybody's concerned and everybody's trying to figure out what's happening next. And everyone uh, has loved ones that they're worried about. And so there's a, there's a hunger for information about, about everything, including people's health. And they're hearing so much about COVID, they're not stopping uh, to ask them the equally important questions. So um, we've been rolling out messaging um, customized to, yes, you still need to keep your annual checkup. Um, yes, you still need to get that screening. It is safe to see your doctor. And by the way, if you're not sure, telehealth is an option. So, Telehealth needs to be part of your long-term strategic plan, right? It's, it's not going anywhere. Um, it's not just about messaging. It's also about more than messaging. There's a lot of concern from a business standpoint that the trends we just dis discussed will be permanent or long-lasting, that even when there is a, a vaccine, that a new muscle memory will have arisen where people don't get checkups or screens or listen to them to their body when there's a problem. And the thing to remember is these behaviors are changing and if you don't embrace it, someone else will and they already are and it's the only aspect of their business and they see opportunity and so would I. This was released today. So my quick math is, you know, a $40 million growth year over year in the first quarter. And by the way, most of that I'm guessing was just in March because this really took hold at the end of the first quarter. So Teladoc is one example is having a, a field day. And 
and I hope they do well. And I hope that everyone gets health care. And personally, you know, that's, that's job one. Job two is making sure my clients get health care. But there's an opportunity for the best of both worlds. You can deliver care to your patients in a virtual setting where you can now assess their long-term needs. And that's what this is really all about. It's about understanding telehealth as a bridge to better outcomes and the future of your practice, right? So loyalty and relationship building is an opportunity. You know, uh, different administrations might have different perspectives on ACOs and population health management and, and whether, uh, you know, fee-for-service fee for or, or pay-for-performance or all these things. But it's pretty clear when you talk to, uh, when you look at the trends and you talk to experts, more and more, we're all going to be judged and perhaps uh, paid by how, how well patients respond to our treatment. And the way to do that is through loyalty. You know, and loyalty is the reason you still drive halfway across town and past two hospitals to deliver your baby, or they open up an urgent care office half as far from the other one you've, already, you've gone to for years, but you still go to the one you used to go to. Um, and this is a really key part of your business is developing loyalty and making sure your patients stay with you and look at you as someone they turn to for their care. And that's the role that telehealth plays. So operationally, we're encouraging our clients, and again, we are marketing and branding experts, but we see the overlap between the operational side and the marketing side. Um, we are predicting that some of the FaceTime type approaches will be potentially rolled back and that we'll need HIPAA compliant virtual visit technology. Um, you know, workflow and, and how that's managed will need to change. Um, transformation of how that affects your facilities. You know, if, if more of your patients are, are calling in for telehealth, what does that mean for you? Um, you know, I, we were, I was speaking to someone the other day who told me this is telehealth stuff's great. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm prescribing medication all the time. I used to be on the phone three hours a day making adjustments to medication. and Now I do it through telehealth and I can bill for it. Um, so maybe there are some upsides to this if we look at it from the right perspective and consider it not just a messaging opportunity, but also an operational opportunity. And again, it's not just slapping a banner on your website. It's the way you communicate with your, your patients. It's what you represent to them. We are the group you come to for this health need and we can, do, we can see you in any number of ways. And we usually start with telehealth for your convenience and then we bring you in if you need um, you know, more, more serious care or something like that. That's up to you and your practice. But what is the plan for how telehealth fits in after this is a crisis situation? Integrate your brand into your telehealth identity. If more and more people are gonna be getting to know you this way, you would have a sign on your, on your door, wouldn't you? You'd have a sign on your storefront. You would have uh, a logo on your lab coat, this is the same thing. This is the way your patients are going to be seeing you. And most, and most of these um, platforms allow you, to do it, allow you to do it for just a few hundred dollars. We would also encourage you to think about the next time there's a crisis. And, 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 and were you satisfied with how fast you were able to move this time? When, when all your patients were canceling their visits, when you weren't sure how to communicate with them, um, you know, did you know who to call? Did you know the passwords? Did you know how to make quick decisions? Um, did you know what to do when the ball was hit to you? Um, you know, again, we saw some, some different uh, outcomes to that kind of litmus test. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pleased and honored to work with clients with great leadership. Um, and those that had a plan for this really did well and we were able to support them in their time of need. Um, but for others, you know, when, when the, the the keys to the, the communications kingdom, so to speak, is, is spread across six or seven agencies. Um, and the person who used to work there has all the passwords and you have to track him or her down. Uh, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to implement your strategy, no matter how good it is. Okay, well, you know, we, we appreciate your time. We're gonna take some, some question and answer here. Um, 
you know, telehealth is an interesting topic. It's been around for decades. Um, my mother apparently gets the lens uh, emails because she, she called me yesterday to say, you know, I was doing telehealth 22 years ago when I was teaching uh, as a professor at Medical College of Georgia, you know, and I, I said, mom, that's so unlike you to tell me that you're way ahead of me on something. But the technology has been around. Patients have liked it. It has some obvious benefits. It has some obvious challenges. The physician clinician perspective on its limitations couldn't be more valid. Um, you know, there's conversations in Washington about it, of course, and, and there is lobbying about it. Um, but, you know, the story of telehealth is this is happening. It's happening right now. Um, you know, we've reached a tipping point where it built and built and built, and now the, the dam has burst. And um, we truly believe that it's going to change behavior in some, in some lasting ways. And we think that you have an opportunity right now to factor that in into your plans. So, okay. And I see some questions. Um, one question is, should we, how should we get the word out? Um, I would say any way that you can get to your patients quickly and efficiently is the answer. Um, so, and this is kind of what I mean. We do know people who said, oh man, we need to, we need an e-newsletter now. Now that, we, now that we, we need telehealth, we need an e-newsletter. And that's, you know, that's better than not recognizing it but that's not what you, the position you, you would prefer to find yourself in. Uh, position you prefer to find yourself in is, we have six to eight things we always do and we have to get the message out and we're gonna do them now and we're gonna put our message and we're gonna disseminate. So direct to your existing patients would be my priority because they know you and trust you and you're not additionally trying to persuade them to trust your doctor or brand with their health. You're just trying to get them to do something they've already uh, emotionally committed to through a different approach, which is telehealth. So I would get to your existing patients through your portal, through your e-newsletter if you have one, through social media. Most practices and hospitals, social media followers are existing patients um, and all of the above. Um, if you have existing campaigns uh, in place, that's something else we did a lot of. Very early on, uh, we were changing some of the messaging because there was some uncertainty for everybody. And, and at first, our message became a little softer. You know, uh, we had some clients with very elective procedures um, that, that to their, their credit, didn't want to sound tone deaf during such a, a serious situation. Uh, over time, we evolved to a telehealth uh, message through uh, any paid channels that were in place. So if you have paid channels, I would look at, at adjusting your message to at least integrate to let people know that's part of what you offer. That could be Google ads. That could be anything. Radio is nimble. Television is usually less nimble, um, but, uh, but there's opportunities everywhere. Um, I would start with your existing patients, roll out that owned media, and then, and then look to see um, where else you can go. Now, earned media, uh, public relations, news coverage, what have you, again, everybody is taking in the news like never before. This is of interest to people. Health has never been more top of mind for the American public than it is right now. Um, unfortunately, not always transferring to these quote unquote day-to-day -day health needs, very focused on COVID as we talked about a minute ago. Um, if you can communicate your existing patients through SMS or text and you have their, their uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, approval to do so, I think that's great. I would remember that our attention spans are very short. If you're doing that, make it easy for them to know what to do. Give them a link to click, make it very, very clear. We offer this, this is how you do it. Um, and patients also are wondering about, of course, what it'll cost them. So that would be a third thing I'd recommend. Okay. Um, you know, what's great is a, a a great friend just asked, do we know how many people on the call are using an EHR related telehealth versus a, a standalone? Uh, I don't, but I'll tell you what, if, if, if there are any questions that um, people on this, this webinar have, 
uh, we can share them with all the registrants and, and see what comes back and then share the results of that. So we did that brief survey. Um, but if there's other questions you have for this group, we'd be happy to, to collect those uh, and, and, and disseminate them and, and share feedback. Um, let's see here. Do we have a, do we have contact information? I don't know if we do on the next slide, Tom. There we go. That's my email address. You can send them to me. Um, also you can find us at our website. Let's see what other questions we have here. Okay, some great comments. Um, broadcast media is doing very, very well. Um, you know, you would expect every, every situation like this has quote unquote winners and losers. You know, um, it's difficult to be in the restaurant business right now. Um, it's great to be in the shipping business, right? And so similarly, we're seeing things, um, different media are, are seeing different results, but by and large media, um, is doing well, television's doing very well, radio is holding its own. Some of the outdoor, maybe a little less visibility because people aren't out of their houses as much, um, what have you. A lot of digital, of course, you know, just continues to grow. It's interestingly a very effective, cost-effective time to advertise because what you're seeing is large uh, media audiences, but way fewer companies that have the money uh, because of the downturn to spend on media. So you've got the audience growth, which usually drives price surges, but instead we're seeing a lot of media willing to negotiate lower pricing, uh, defer payments, all these different things. So it's a great time uh, to, to buy media if you, if you have your reasons for doing so. Um, okay, uh, marketing telehealth um, out of, out of uh, your market. I think that's a great question and you know, I'll confess, I don't have, I don't have data on that. Um, I have a few instincts. Um, you know, if you have a very loyal patient base and a large patient base, I would look first at, are they accessing you for telehealth? Because you might have some low hanging fruit before you try to figure out how to go in another market. How do you reach them? Do you have to spend money to do that? I mean, do you still have people canceling visits? You know, are your office visits way down? Because you have a you have a group that's already decided that they trust you. They want to turn to you for their care. They know who you are. They have a relationship and that loyalty is your long-term, uh, you know, best, best bet. Um, so certainly telehealth can cross state lines. Um, and I guess it would be on a case by case basis, um, depending on your brand and how strong you think you can pull people in. But my advice would be first to really scrutinize and make sure you're getting uh, participation from your existing uh, patients. Um, and, and Mike, I would just uh, add to that to, uh, to look at the evolving uh, regulatory framework in terms of crossing state lines. There, those, those restrictions about crossing state lines have been relaxed during the crisis, but um, it's, there are still some conditions and it's not clear what, uh, which of those restrictions might return after the crisis has passed. So do your due diligence on the regulatory framework there. Thank you, Tom. That's, I needed that. Um, someone asked about a postcard and whether that was effective. Um, the, the answer is, is, is my, my favorite marketing answer, which is it depends. Um, a really good postcard to the right audience can be very effective. You know, um, I, I can really get on a soapbox with, um, my class when I, when I, when I do the healthcare marketing lectures, because I, I liked, you know, they're, they're these 20 somethings and they're brilliant. And also they only know what they know. And they've been, they've been told that the digital revolution changed everything and it changed so much, but there are some things that were in place previously that are kind of the, the grandfather of digital marketing that are present with direct mail, um, segmenting audiences, right? Having a really good list, a B testing, um, being able to measure results based on a return phone call or what have you. Um, the idea that you can cheaply reach lots of people and you only need uh, a small response rate for to, 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 to get return on investment. Um, so yes, a postcard can be really good strategy 
if it's the right audience. Um, if you're talking to people, you know, their exact uh, age or demographic or geography for you. Now, getting a postcard out and in the mail takes a lot longer than some of the other things we're talking about, right? Source the list or pull the list from your patients, design it, print it, go through the mail house. You know, even first class mail, it's often a couple weeks before those are going to land and repetition becomes expensive because you have to do it multiple times to get your, your message across. So yes, it can work, but I don't, I wouldn't do it on a singular basis. And I think again, some of these more owned channels like your website, your, your EHR, your e-newsletter, your social media is, is where I'd reach first. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a comment just about sensitivity. I mean, it's important, you know, I mean, we have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are losing their lives. Um, all of them with loved ones who are suffering. Um, we're going to have a tremendous economic fallout from this. Um, we are unsure of what's happening next. So there's fear, there's uncertainty. I mean, this is a perfect storm of all the, of all the things that we worry about. Um, so yes, the messaging has to be sensitive. Um, you know, and that, that's one reason why, just as a, for instance, we presented the, the public health message earlier. Um, we thought that that was a way to address a public health need, also market your practice, you don't have to get into a competitive situation. You don't have to say, we're better than those guys. You can just say, you need to get your screening. You need to get your checkup. And if you say that to your patient, you mean it well. And also, it doesn't come off as offensive. It doesn't come off as, we need your business. It comes up off as, we need to help you with your health. Um, OK. Um, how to go about get, I think just last question, I think, how do you, how about, how do you go about getting in the news? Um, well, the, the news wants viewers and listeners. Um, that means they want stories that are interesting. Um, you know, the, rarely just the fact that you're doing something with your business, whether it's t telehealth or an operational adjustment, is that newsworthy? Generally, you need to tell stories. Um, there was a patient who was concerned about coming to the office, but we talked him into a telehealth visit and we, we uncovered this important urgent health need. Now we're treating them in a safe setting and we saved their lives and what a great story. That's the kind of thing the news wants to, to report on or, or storytelling. So you need to be telling stories, developing uh, you know, patient stories and then reaching out to the, to the media or hiring somebody uh, to reach out to the media for you. Um, but it needs to be emotional storytelling, not just operational adjustments. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Tom, do you have anything else? Uh, no. Appreciate y'all joining us for this conversation. Thanks for your time, guys. We'll, uh, we, I believe, have recorded this. That's what the flashing red button on my screen indicates. And um, we'll be sending this out. And also uh, really appreciate the, the uh, request for kind of crowdsourcing some information. We'll